Good morning and welcome to worship here at Chapel Hill United Methodist Church. It is such a joy to be able to gather in the warmth of this physical space as well as the warmth of the love of this church family on such a cold and windy day. So I invite you now to rise and to greet those around you with that same warm love. stand together and sing our morning hymn. truly in awe of who you are. We are lost in wonder and love and praise. And yet so often in our lives we lose sight of who you are and we become stuck in old ways and bad habits. Oh God, wake us up this day. Help us to remember the depth of your love and the wideness of your grace. Help us to become the people that you have created us to be. Amen. Well, good morning, Chapel Hill. The joy it is to be here with you this morning. 
gather together to worship our God whose love and grace is so big and covers anything and everything we've done. Anywhere we've been, we know that God is here this morning. That no matter where we come from, God wants to enter us, enter into God, into that love and grace. So let us sing together.
to do this more often. <laughs> you may be seated. That song is really the theme of our sermon series, our worship series for the next seven or eight weeks because it's about grace and being set free from all the things that trap us. And so this morning we get to practice that in the form of a dedication that we proclaim this message that these children are beautiful and they're gifts and grace is amazing in lots of ways so Abigail and Jacob and Judah and Rory we're going to call her Eleanor today come on up here please and family that have gathered thank you for being here today it's a blessing to have you with us come on up here please we're going to have you stand right up here and just so that I can do some teaching here, we are a United Methodist congregation and we baptize people of all ages. But we have people here who come from traditions where baptizing babies is not the practice. So I asked our bishop, I said, what do we do to honor people who are in our midst who are not in the practice of baptizing babies. Do we ever dedicate them? He said, well, I know your mission. Your mission is to welcome all people to experience and share the extraordinary grace and love of Jesus Christ. So why would you not do it? I said, I'm simply asking for your permission. I would love to do it. He said, I want to give my blessing because it's an important statement that you really are a church that is open to all people. So we hope that you experience this as part of our mission today. So Jacob and Abigail Cook. Abigail's on our staff. She's delightful. And she's the director of our adult ministries. And Jacob has been studying for so long <laughs> that he's ready to get his PhD. And he's ABD all but done. All but the <laughs> dissertation. He's almost there. And he's teaching as an adjunct at Friends currently, right? 
So, these two beautiful children, as I've named, are gifts. And therefore, there will be a day when you will use water. One of the things that Bishop Jones said to me is, really, we're baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. And there will be a day when they'll be baptized with water. And I thought that was beautiful. So, Jacob and Abigail, I'm going to ask you questions that will be asked of them at that day when they give their own public profession of faith in Christ. So, congregation, follow along on the screens, if you would, please. On behalf of the whole church, Jacob and Abigail. I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world? And do you repent of your sin? If so, please say, we do. We do. We do. And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? If so, please say, we do. Yeah. We do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, please say, we do. We do. And will you nurture Judah and Eleanor in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, please say, we will. we will. Congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your commitment to Christ and your rejection of sin? If so, please say, we do. We do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Judah and Eleanor now before you in your care? If so, please respond with us. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Judah and Eleanor with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. Amen. Whenever we um, come before God to acknowledge this special gift of children and to promise our commitment to God, we also remember that we do not do this alone. We do not do this as just Chapel Hill. We do not even do this just as the United Methodist Church, but rather we do this as the church universal. And so in that, uh, in that spirit, let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of, of heaven, heaven and, and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered, suffered under Pontius, Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, who's going to go first? Maybe we'll let him be up. Okay. Judah, you look really nice today. Can you smell that? I'm going to mark you with this oil as a symbol of God's blessing, as a symbol of how God is going to be working in your life. And I know I'm just speaking a bunch of words right now, but it's true. It's, you'll see it. Judah, I mark you with the sign of the cross to remind you that you belong to Jesus. And I pray his blessing on your hands that you will serve him and upon your feet that you will follow him and upon your heart that you will always know of his love for you and upon your lips that you will always speak of love for him and upon the whole of your life that you will always know that Jesus loves you 
that he's with you. He'll never, ever leave you. Amen. Can you say amen, Judah? Amen. <laughs> and Eleanor, or you call her Rory, right? So Eleanor. Oh. <laughs> you you want to smell it? Try smelling it. She's saying, what is this strange man doing to me here? <laughs> How about if I try this? <laughs> Eleanor. Well, <laughs> can I try your hand? Okay, let's try the hand. Maybe, maybe daddy needs to do this, or mommy. Yeah. Yeah, let's let daddy do it. Let's okay, try. let's have daddy try it. <laughs> Oops, sorry, Judah. <laughs> All right. So, Eleanor, we mark you with the sign of the cross so that you might know that you belong to Jesus and we pray his blessing on your hands that you will serve him upon your feet that you will follow him upon your heart that you will always know of his love for you and upon your lips that you will always speak of love for him and upon the whole of your life that you will always and everywhere know that Jesus loves you that he's with you <laughs> now this is supposed to be fun right I mean who says that it has to it's a beautiful thing I'm having fun good well your children are awesome and so we ask you both now do you accept these two beautiful children as God's gifts to you and do you intend to raise them up in the faith that they will come to know that grace that we have sung about that is amazing, that sets us free from anything that would keep us from becoming the beautiful persons God has created us to be. If so, please say, we will. We will. Pastor Jill, would you offer the prayer for the family, please? <laughs> this is real man. life, right? This is real life with yeah, kids. Yeah, that's right. And this is real life with kids in the midst of church. And we give thanks that Chapel Hill is a church where kids can be kids Amen. in the midst of worship. So let us pray. Amen. Oh God, we thank you so much for Abigail and Jake, for Jude and Rory, for this family. And we would ask your blessing upon their lives individually and also their lives as a family, that as they follow you and seek to walk together in the way that leads to life eternal, that you would be present with them every step of the way. We give you thanks. Amen. Amen. And Jacob and Abigail... It is our pleasure, it is our privilege to receive you as members of this congregation. And thank you for blessing us with all the gifts that you bring. And may we be a community that surrounds you with love and forgiveness and care and prayers so that you too, just like your beautiful children, might grow up. Not that you need to grow up, but grow up in the faith. <laughs> and be and become all that God would desire. Amen? Amen? So our applause is our way of saying God bless you. We're so glad that you're here. So good. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, indeed it is God's grace that works in our lives before we even know, before we even acknowledge maybe that there is a God. And that here at Chapel Hill, we proclaim God's grace at least once in every worship service because we take communion at the end. And that in and of itself is a proclamation of God's great gift to us through the life of Jesus Christ. When we serve you communion, we want this to be a personal experience for you. And so if you haven't done so already, I invite you to find a name tag in the back of a seat in front of you. Write your name on it and, and put it on. So that when we serve you communion today, we can call you by name as we do so. 
We also want to invite you to find your humongous bulletin that you received as you came in. I'm sure there were comments. There were comments at the first service too. There is a reason you have such a big bulletin and, and we will have a big bulletin for this whole series because if you turn it over, there are lots of places for notes during this sermon series. And so as Pastor Jeff preaches today, we're inviting you to follow along, to write down, fill in the blanks. There's some multiple choice options going on. Even we want you to keep this. Take it home with you. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it this week so that you might remember the ways that we are learning and growing together here at Chapel Hill during this worship series. On the front side, you'll also notice at the bottom that tear-off communication card that has that information on it that we always invite you to share with us. Write down your contact information. If you want to sign up for the email newsletter, if you have a prayer request, share that with us. Uh, we want to be in ministry with you. And then tear that off and place it in the offering plate as a way to offer your presence this morning to God. Another way that you can learn more about what's happening at Chapel Hill is by picking up a copy of the January messages. This has all kinds of information about ministries for all ages um, here at Chapel Hill and also ways that you can serve and be in mission out in the community. If you are a guest this morning, we especially hope that you'll leave us your contact information so we can reach out and welcome you to Chapel Hill. We also have a gift for you, and it involves chocolate, so we hope that you'll stop by the, the welcome table in the fellowship hall following worship so that we can personally greet you and welcome you to this space. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds for giving as we pray. Lord of all life, we know that all that we are and everything we have ultimately rests in your hands. And yet what our minds know, our hearts so often forget. And so this day, O oh God, we pray that you would give us the wisdom to know how to share our resources. Give us the humility to understand the way you call us to live. And give us the courage to open our hands and our hearts and give freely. We pray these things in the name of the one who is our everything. Amen.
Thank you, choir. And thank you to David Nelson for conducting today because Dr. Jen Stevenson is receiving an award from her doctoral dissertation, and so she's in Alabama receiving that, and we're happy for her, but thank you, David, for directing. Well, we're starting this new sermon series, as Pastor Jill said, titled Unstuck, and I want to encourage you to follow along on the back of this gigantic card, and somebody asked me if it was the large print edition. I said, yes, because I need it. I don't know about you, but so if you're a note-taking kind of person, it's there for you, and if you're not, just set it aside. But how many of you have ever been stuck? Have you ever been stuck in life? Maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually, maybe relationally, mentally. Well, I went to make a hospital call at Wesley Medical Center, and I went to the new children's hospital. And I, you could tell that you're in the children's hospital because it's wonderfully painted and it's very bright. But I noticed that the elevator was rather old in the midst of all the new. So I press the button, the door opens, and I am going to the second floor because I'm going to see Nelwyn Robinson. So I press 2, the door closes, I start reading my email, and I'm thinking, this is the smoothest ride for such an old elevator. Well, probably three or four minutes go by, and the door doesn't open. So I press two, it lights up, the door does not open. So I press the open door button, and the door opens. And there, as is typical of all elevators, is the sign that says floor one. So I'm thinking, well, I don't know what just happened, but I press 2 again. It lights up. The door closes. This time I'm not reading my email. I'm waiting for the elevator to move. It doesn't move. I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh, I'm stuck. I look down, and fortunately there's a telephone there, and I'm thinking I may need to use that. So... I press the door open button, the door opens, I walk out, I go to the nearest telephone and I call security and I said, there's an elevator, it's the one facing hillside, it's furthest, they weren't numbered, so I was trying to describe this elevator and the security guard said, well, who are you? And I was thinking, well, what does it matter who I am? The elevator's broke. Well, he says, who are you? And I answer him, thinking, I don't know why we're wasting time on that, but so I tell him, and he says, well, you can't go to the second floor. I said, well, no one's on the second floor. How am I supposed to get to the second floor? He said, well, she can't be on the second floor, because that's where the residents sleep. It's a restricted floor. I said, well, I thought maybe the elevator was broken. He said, no, you're broken. (laughs) No one was on the third floor. But have you ever had that experience where you feel like you're stuck, where you push the button and you don't go where you want to go, where things just don't work out like you thought they would work out? Being stuck can have a variety of expressions in our life. Isn't that true? So I want us to look at this Bible verse that is going to be used throughout this series. I love this this promise that is spoken. Would you read it with me, please? I have seen how they acted, but I will heal them. I will lead them and help them. I will comfort those who hurt. I offer peace to all near and far. So here's the question of the day. From what do you, from what do I need to recover? And if you are thinking, well, I don't have anything that I need to recover from, take out your card. And there's about 20 different things that are listed there. And you might want to add a few to the list if I've missed the thing that you think that you need to recover from. Now, if you leave here today and say there's nothing in my life that I need to recover from, you are suffering from a problem called denial. 
D-E-N-I-A-L. And may I remind you what denial stands for. Don't even know I am lying. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. It's a bad joke, isn't it? So there's a French guy named James Thurber who said long ago, this is a brilliant quote, try to learn before you die from what you run and to and why. Try to learn before you die from what you run and to and why. And here's the thing, everybody does that. Everybody does that. It's part of the human experience. We call it the human condition. So, today we've gathered to pray for people who have problems, and today we're especially praying for the people who don't think they have any problems because that is their problem. You're a tough crowd this morning. So, we're going to engage every week in looking at the word recovery as an acrostic. And where do we begin? With R. Realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and my life is unmanageable. Now, the very first thing that human beings do is to say, I know that that's true for some people, but that's not true for me. This thing called denial is deep. And it's a river that runs deep within every one of our souls. So what's the cause of my problem? What's the cause of my denial? What's the cause of my pride, my ego that's running amok? It's that we all want to play God. And it goes back to Adam and Eve. Because God was very clear, you have all this freedom, but don't do this one thing. And what is it that they do? The one thing. So when I teach parenting with love and logic, I say to them, if you ever need for your child to take a medication, don't say, you're going to take this medication. Just say, don't take this medication, and then they'll want it. Right? <laughs> That's part of the human condition. And St. Paul said these words after his conversion. I want to emphasize that. He did not say this before he was converted. He was an evil bad man who did all kinds of things, murdered all kinds of people. He was mean to the core. And after he saw the light and was converted, he said, read with me please, I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to do, what I hate. I know perfectly well what I'm doing is wrong, but I can't help myself. It is sin inside of me that is stronger than I am that makes me do these evil things. Now, that's pretty bleak, isn't it? And yet it's hopeful. Because at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. There is no one of us that is exempt from the civil war of the soul where we want to do what's right and we feel the pull to do what we shouldn't do. And this takes many different forms. For example, do you ever stay up late when you know that you need more sleep? Do you ever eat or drink more calories than your body needs? Do you ever feel you ought to exercise but you don't? This last week I woke up and said it's too cold. It's just way too cold. It's not good for the body to do that. <laughs> do you ever know the right thing to do, but you don't do it? Do you ever know something is wrong, but you do it anyway? Have you ever done anything that you would consider to be selfish? Have you ever tried to control somebody or something? Now, we could go all day with all kinds of scenarios that remind us that we want to control our lives and those of us who want to control our lives and everybody and everything around us it's a form of playing God and what are we doing we're denying our humanity and we're trying to control everyone and everything because what is the center letter of the word sin I now hear this the goal is not 
for us to leave here this morning saying, I'm a terrible bad person, I'm a worm, I'm worthless, there's nothing good about me, I have no value. If you go down that path, that is as unhealthy as the person who says that I've got it all together, I'm God's gift to everyone and everything, I am just da-da-da-da-da, I'm all that. Both extremes are equally dangerous. Now, for those of you who come from the psychological realm, an overdeveloped ego or an underdeveloped ego are equally destructive. And most Christians don't struggle with an overdeveloped ego. Some do. Most Christians struggle with an underdeveloped ego. That's where they've been taught to believe that they're worthless. They have no value. And they buy into all the lies that go with that. And that's all part of control. And it's all rooted in pride. One of the most significant things that ever happened to me in my life is when my spiritual director looked at me, a Roman Catholic nun, and said, do you realize that every time you put yourself down, you're insulting the Almighty? I said, what? I thought that was humility. She said, it's not humility. It's pride. It's your way of playing God. You know more than God. I'll tell you, God, who I am. <laughs> so whether it's inadequacy, whether it's inferiority, whether it's a deep sense of feeling defected, all of that is rooted in our desire to play God, to think that we know more about ourselves than does God. So we control our image. It's easy for me sometimes to say to you, guess what, I don't watch very much TV, but I watch this show. <laughs> or, I want you to think certain things about me, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit so that you have a good image of me. So we wear masks, and we pretend, and we fake it. That's why Adam and Eve... What did they do in the garden after they messed up? They hid, trying to control our image. There's a priest in the Roman Catholic tradition, John Powell. I've got all of his books. They're phenomenal, all 18 of them. He has one book titled, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? And the reason is you might not accept me. You might reject me. It's one way we play God. Another way is we control other people. Now, I know nobody in here does that, right? And so how does that happen primarily? It's through blame. Well, you did this. It's your fault. Pointing fingers. My spiritual director one day when I was pointing my finger because I was so animated and adamant about what I was saying, she said, Jeff, just look at what you're doing. You got three fingers pointing back at you. I say, you're so right. Blaming other people is one way we try to control people. Or we try to control our problems and say, I don't need help. I'm okay. I've got this figured out. We sometimes don't realize how this plays out because we end up in fear. Now, fear is a gift. Fear is a gift in that it tells us something is wrong. But unresolved fear will always lead to hate. And that's what's going on in our nation right now, in my humble opinion, is that we have a lot of people that are afraid. And unresolved fear is going to lead to hate because we are not created to live with unresolved fear. So we will scapegoat we will take that fear and put it on another person or another group and say you're the problem if only you would change then I wouldn't feel this way now do we know that consciously not always Adam I was afraid because I was naked so I hid or frustration at Chuck E. Cheese and at All Star Sports there is a game I don't know what it's called I tried to find out this week but I thought it'd be kind of silly for me to walk into Chuck E. Cheese or All-Star Sports and say, I'm just looking for a game. I want to take a picture of your game. And 
But have you ever been to those places where that game has about 25, I think if I remember right, they're alligator heads. What's it called? That's it. And so one pops up and you take the rubber mallet and you, right? And then after you do that, then two pop up and you, and then after that, three pop up, and then four pop up, and they're just popping up all over the place and you're just doing it. And, and that's a life that is rooted in the I where we become frustrated and we become afraid. That's why Paul says, I want to do what is right. I env- inevitably do what is wrong that's frustration fatigue we get tired and we fail and we fail to the point that then we think we're terrible bad people and they were hopeless and we're helpless and that's why the proverb said you will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins confess them and give them up then God will show mercy to you the first step is rooted in this idea we're not God and we're not created to be God so turn to your neighbor and say there is a God go ahead please turn to your neighbor say there is a God and you are not God why is it that that part was louder (laughs) so Janice come on up here please this is Janice Douglas who's walking up here She sent me a letter on December the 13th in preparation for this sermon series. So everybody say, good morning, Janice. How long have you been coming to Chapel Hill? About eight years. Eight years. Hold this close because they want to hear from you. So I am so grateful that you sent me this letter. And give them the Reader's Digest version of what you said in the letter. I I wrote a letter to support the pastor in this because when I was 32 years old, I um, um, I had been lost for about 15 years, and so when I was 32, I found the, I didn't find it. God helped me find the 12-step program, and by way of my doctor and treatment center at St. Joe's Hospital and the doors of AA, and. Uh, I have learned to live this program over whatever years was 30, 30? I'm looking at my husband. Over 30 years. Yeah, so. So what, what brought you to the end of your rope? Um, soul sickness. Soul sickness. I was suffering from, um, I had punched holes in my own soul, and other people had punched holes in my soul along the way, and um, I was suffering from what I would call um, a spiritual disease, a spiritual disease, and I was trying to cover those holes up, you know, with alcohol or whatever else was coming my way, you know. And so, could you relate to that fear and frustration? Oh yeah, and... I walked with a lot of fear. I mm-hmm. walked with a lot of fear. So you got to the end of your rope, and you went to see your doctor. Right. I and... asked God. I, I I cried out to God one night, and I said, I can't go on like this. Please help me. And and uh, he heard me. So yeah. you went to your doctor, and what did the doctor say? Um, he said, my doctor said, I'll be right back. And he came back, and he said, uh, I have you set ready to go at St. Joe's Hospital on Monday. And this was on a Friday, and I thought, well, you know, they don't let me. I'm a, I, I was a supervisor on my job, and I went, and I said, well, they, I work every weekend. I have for the last three years. They're not going to let me get off, and I never get off on weekends. And I can't go. I went in, and, the, and, my, super, and my manager I told her that I thought I had a drinking problem, and Dr. One put me in, and she said, well, you know, you don't know this part. <laughs> she said, well, you know that um, uh, my dad has drank for years and years, and two years ago we sat down and had an intervention, and uh, he hasn't had a drink. He went and got help, and you take all the time you need. Wow, that was a gift. Oh, yeah. So, so you go to St. Joe, and what happens there? Um, that's... When I got to St. Joe's, it was it was really an education kind of thing, and so they take you in these classrooms, and I went in the classroom. Of course, you know they give you B vitamins and all that stuff, and but um, I went in this classroom, and on the walls was the twelve steps and twelve what they call the twelve traditions. And when I looked up and I saw this thing about 
you know, turning your will and your life over to care of God. I looked at it, and I honestly, you know, my first reaction was, oh, my God, it's a Jesus Speak program. <laughs> and how did I get into this? And I was looking for a way out. I mean, that's the truth. <laughs> You know. So you thought this was a Jesus freak program? <laughs> oh yeah, I thought oh, God. and I had spent. Um, uh, I have was raised in a parochial environment, and uh, although I don't choose to be Catholic today, I'm very proud of my Catholic roots. Yes. And um, but I had to make peace with a lot of things that I had been taught, and that's when the Episcopal pastor, or priest that was at St. Joe's Hospital, he. He um, told a group of us that God did not invent religion and that man did and that anything that man was involved in, it was going to get messed up. Sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that really opened a door for me to be able to take everything I had learned about God and Jesus because, you know, after 12 years of parochial school, you know, I pretty much knew how to worship and I knew about the Bible and I knew about Jesus. I did not know how to have a relationship with God. And so I took everything that I've been taught, set it aside, and um, got an open mind and said, if it means I don't have to ever drink again, then I, I, I made a, an agreement with God. We made a covenant one night, and I said, if it means I don't have to drink again, and I don't have to be this kind of lonesome stuff in your soul, then I will do what you asked me to do. Wow. And uh, we made a covenant, and from that point on, it's not that I've never wanted to drink again or that I've never had problems since then. This last year has been a little rough, actually, but um, it just means that I have learned, in it, and by way of the 12 steps, um, I have let go of things. Mm -hmm. I've let go of people. I've let, I've, I've, my soul sickness, only the master could heal. And by way of the 12 steps, um, we've opened those old wombs a little at a time. And we've let go of people that have hurt us. And the hardest part in ways has been to forgive myself yeah. for how I hurt other people along the way. Not so much how I hurt myself. I can live with that. But when I think of the effects that I, that I have had on other people, mm -hmm. that, that bothers me a lot. Mm -hmm. So Janice, when I got your letter, I was so struck by it. I will treasure it forever, honestly. And you name in here something I want you to talk about, where you said it's even possible to make religion your drug of choice. Yeah, anything that, yeah, because along the way, I mean, it's been over 30 years, but you know, I became, I moved from um, like being an alcoholic to uh, 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 a, a al alcoholic, you know, and mean, then from then. So, what do you mean by that? Taking it away from your family, diving in so far that that. Um, so um, AA became. Yeah, it can one. become, and then and then I, then it was like you know become a workaholic. I can do that, and and then throw myself in the church and say, oh look, look at me, man, I'm in a church now, you know, and <laughs> and and uh, but if it stops you. From have, building that relationship, that personal relationship, then it, it can become an addiction. Religion can become an addiction when it. AA says when it creates a problem, you probably have a problem. So if you are, um, if it's interfering with your personal life, with your family, your children, they don't know who you are, you don't know who they are, then you might want to be looking a little closer and doing a little more inventory, a little more inventory. That's She's profound, isn't she? So, Janice, one final question, because you and I could go on all day. But for the person here today who is struggling, who feels lonely, who feels fear, who feels frustrated, who just can't get things to go their way, what would you say? I would say take a, take, open your mind and open your heart and take a look at these 12 steps. Um, they're guidelines. It's not about perfection. It's about taking little things and building a relationship with our master. You know, like I said, we can come in here and we can sing all day long, but that doesn't mean that when we walk out of here that we, we aren't still hurting. Mm -hmm. And I would say reach out to people you can trust and um, tell people if you're in need of prayers. Tell people if, you, if it's not going well. And, and 
And I got to be honest with you, that relationship means that you can argue with God. You can walk and talk with God the same way Abraham did and the same way Moses did. And Abraham was always trying to poor negotiate. And you can have those. I stood for 20 minutes one time in my kitchen. And quite frankly, I was yelling at God because I did not like what was going down. And, and um, my son, uh, we told my son that if he could either choose to be a part of our family or um, he could choose drugs. And if he chose drugs, then he would not be living in our house. And when he walked out the door, I knew that he was not coming back. And um, so I just kind of ran and raved at God for 20 minutes. And then I finally just told him that if this is what I'm supposed to do, then you are going to have to grant me some kind of peace of mind. And uh, that peace came. And, and uh, sometimes we just have to trust. You know, but the important thing is to know that we we can have a relationship with God, but we can't, and we can fix ourselves with God's help when you have spiritual disease. But we can't fix. I can't fix none of you guys, you know. And 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 in all honesty, I'm not good at fixing myself a lot of times either. Sometimes I need my husband to point some things out, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> I want you to take out your card for just a moment as we close this. If you look at the cure, the cure for this is surrender, right? Yep. It's where we Acceptance turn it over. And surrender. And so admitting that I'm not God means I know I am powerless to change anyone or anything, that I'm powerless to control anyone or anything, that I'm powerless to cope really with anyone or anything on my own true so it's all about surrender so that scripture god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble he truly truly does what give is you grace, grace to you grace is that acceptance of understanding that irregardless of what i've done that even if i was the only person that ever lived on this earth that Jesus would have come down here and and died for me. That it's it's an, he doesn't view us as a community. He views us as individuals. And um, grace for me means that that there's a power out there beyond us. And if we ask for it, and if we're honest, because it does take honesty to look at yourself. And and if we trust God. Things, things we may not we may go to our death not understanding some things but when we get there we may find out that it has something to do with the hundred years from now you know that St. Paul you know that said those things had no way of knowing that 2,000 years ago you'd be using that with us right you know so he, he went to his grave probably thinking you know I still can't get it right yeah. but he gives us you know that ability to, to say well Everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. We're right. all the same, and we're the same in God's eyes. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Would you thank Janice for her willingness to be vulnerable and to share with us? And so, Janice, what we're going to do now is just to invite us to have a time of reflection on those two questions that I asked at the beginning. What is it that we need recovery from? What is it that we're running to? And why? What are we escaping? What are we trying to run from? So I'm going to pray for you in thanksgiving, and then each of us can pray silently. Lord, thank you for Janice. Thank you for her willingness to share. I pray that you would bless her in her vulnerability. I pray in thanksgiving that she stands as one who is redeemed by your blood, whose grace is amazing and sufficient for every need that she will ever have. So we entrust her to you in praise and thanksgiving. Now hear us as we pray our own silent prayers.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit as we prepare to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, and will those who are serving come forward at this time. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, as we come before you this day, we know that there are many among us who need your ongoing healing love and grace. We pray for those who have upcoming surgeries and procedures, for Sue McPherson, Lynette Yandel, for Phil Wiles, God, we pray for those who are in the hospital, for Faye Lee and Nelwyn Robinson. We pray for those who grieve any kind of loss. But Lord, we especially name Lisa Childers upon the death of her brother and Christine Edwards upon the death of her sister. Lord, we lay before you the lives of Marcia Gustin, Don Snyder, Ted King, Anne Womack, and the Aiken family. God, that each of these persons and those on our prayer list have unique needs in their lives right now. And we ask that you would meet them, provide your care and your peace and your grace. And then at the same time, O oh God, we celebrate the ways that you bring our lives together. And so we pray in celebration for the marriage of Katrina Broadhagen and Sanjay Krishaw upon their wedding yesterday. Oh God, we know that you are with us in all things, and we know this because you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to know the frailty and the vulnerability of human life, to know our struggles, to experience temptation. And we know how he gathered with the disciples in the upper room, how he lifted the bread and gave thanks to you and then broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he lifted it up and gave thanks to you. And then he gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon each one gathered here. You know what each heart needs. You know the brokenness that we carry in our souls. And so we ask for your healing grace. God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that they would become for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. O oh God, by your Spirit, make us one, one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. As the elements are distributed to those who are serving, I would remind you that we have an open table, which means regardless of your age or your faith background, you are welcome to come forward and receive. There will be a gluten-free station in the center back of the sanctuary, as well as a station at the front of each section. We invite you to come out the right side and move across the front and return to your seat the opposite way. As you come, open your hands to receive the bread as a sign of receiving God's grace, and then take it and dip it in the cup. 
there are any who can't come forward, we invite you to simply signal to a server in your section, and we'll be happy to come to you. So the table is ready. Will you come?
of the cross to lay our burdens down give us the grace to leave them there amen amen i want to invite kelly oxner to come forward where are you kelly oh she's over here this time she was hiding at the first service because you didn't really want us to do this. But we want to say a special word of thanks to Kelly because she has been working in our First Impressions ministry. And if you know anything about her, she does an excellent job. But we need her in another area of ministry even more than we need her in First Impressions ministry. So she's going to be the administrative assistant for Pastor Jill, assisting with worship and all the planning, and she's excellent at everything she does. But I want to say thank you, Kelly. Now, you didn't listen to my sermon again, did you? That self-deprecating behavior? <laughs> I was out there. Oh, you were out there, okay. So denial is a strong thing, isn't it? So. No, we want to sincerely say thank you to you because you've done an excellent job. I want you to see the photo. These six have graciously agreed to take over. How many people does it take to do Kelly's job? <laughs> and uh, so we're thankful that they have stepped up and we're, we're so thankful for all that you have done to help us with this very important ministry. So may our applause be our way of saying thank you. We're grateful, Kelly. Well, just three very quick announcements. First of all, the Health and Wholeness Retreat is coming up quickly, and there are brochures at the Welcome Center in case you haven't seen one. It's for women and men. It's for men and women. And some of our youth are going to be involved, and some younger children are going to be involved. So I hope that you will consider being a part of this very important event. And then Martin Luther King junior celebration I have my button on Chapel Hill always is a sponsor and the way that we sponsor is that we purchase these buttons as a way of supporting the event and they're free for you to take it's a way to say I want you to know about this it's a really important way to support the African American community finally the Wednesday night at the Hill spring semester has begun but it's not too late to participate there's a variety of classes, and we have a meal. If you want to sing in the choir and all of that, you're welcome. So there's information at the Welcome Center if you need more. So stand, please, if you're able. And find a way to connect with your neighbor in a way that is comfortable for you. If you're standing in the need of prayer today, there will be a couple of pastors, Dr. Ben Staley and Pastor Jill, Pastor Jerry, who will be at the cross to pray with you and for you. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for somebody that you care about. And so as you go forth from this place today, it is our prayer that you have received a word of hope that when we reach the end of our ropes, that's where the good news begins. We're never alone. God is more powerful than any challenge we face. So the invitation is to surrender. So go now in peace, and may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon us and remind us that we are persons of sacred worth. 
where Christ dwells, where Christ takes delight. So go in that promise. Amen and amen. Let's sing our closing song. Go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face with a song in your heart and the promise of grace going.